want to do now is we want to have an opportunity um, because, yes, these are rehearsed, these are planned talks, and we want to have an opportunity to talk to them about, like, what brought you to this moment with this talk? What um, was the process like? What about that content specifically? Um, so, yes, I have a couple planned questions, but then afterwards we have another mic that we'll share with you. Um, just so that if you have a burning question about TED Masterclass, about a specific content that one of these people shared, that we do hope you ask that as well. So I, I want to start first off with TK, because the other three teachers gave talks that were like on the surface so profoundly personal, and yours from like, you know, a quick glance is, but was it? <laughs> I have a really boring and monotonous life, and so there's nothing <laughs> that I can source. Um, you know what? You know there's like kids who always know what they want to be when they grow up? I was never that kid. Um, and so when it came to something like giving a TED Talk, and my thought at the time was I need to have some evocative story. I need to have some kind of thing that happened in my experience that would justify for me to be on the stage. And there was a lot of unlearning that I had to do to say, actually, no, right? Being teacher, right? Uh, being an educator in and of itself justifies being on that stage, right? Um, another thing for those of you who might be thinking, well, I don't have a story, really lean in into this idea of, of, of just ideas and what is it that our unique pr perspective, um, our, our, our proximity to students, the fact that we're a part of a lived community offers us and what is it that we can do um, to tell a story through that lens. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say, and this is for you know educators of color in here, uh, maybe you've already started experiencing this as 2022 toys, um, but oftentimes I feel like as speakers, as content creators, right, we might be pigeonholed into, can you be the person who speaks on DEI, right? What are your thoughts on supporting educators of color? What do you think about Stop Asian Hate? <laughs> and on one hand, right, I want to talk about that. That is my lived experience. But when it came to particularly this talk and, and, and how I wanted to approach it um, was outside of that and to think about my own experiences and ideas outside of my identity. Um, if folks want to talk more about some of the tricky parts of being an educator of color, um, I'm also a gay educator of color, and so identity work is a lot that I talk about. But for me, a big push that I had um, was to speak on something that weren't those because of the ways in which oftentimes we're siloed and pigeonholed into. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yes. It, the talk is incredibly personal, and thank you for that. But I want to talk to the four of you about the fact that you all got to give your talks today, right? Um, two of you from 2020, two of you from 2021. My year, there were three of us. But there's a whole cohort of individuals that are able to go through this process, right? That are able to use the app, develop these talks, and might not get an opportunity to stand on a delightfully red circle <laughs> brought to this fine hotel, right? Or to Ted's headquarters. So what did the process, what did that do for you, and what do you think it would do for anyone, regardless of your opportunity to give this talk today? I'll go. Yeah. Um, it's never too late. I submitted my TED talk after the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I'm just being honest because as, as you're, you are matriculating throughout your year, you will become so busy and overwhelmed. And it's like, oh, my God, one more thing to do. I don't have time to do that. And so I just did the master class when I had a chance. And then I was like, let me just hurry up and submit this video. And I'm here today so you never know what – you have to say how it will impact people and don't feel like your story is not as po as powerful as someone else's. You are who you are and be who you are unapologetically. I'll just say um, that the process itself and all of this, like continued on in your journey, is very introspective. To look at yourself, to 
think about your journeys and what you've been through and what does that mean and what could it mean for somebody else. So even if you don't end up giving a TED Talk, the process of, of looking at yourself, you will um, grow as a person just by going through TED Mass Talk. And you're like, I don't want to speak. I'm not the public speaker. One, you're probably going to be forced into it as teacher of the year at some point to give some speech somewhere. And just the art of storytelling, it's like a beautiful, I love the app and what it taught me, even if I never came here today. It is still very much worthwhile. Even you're like, I'm not speaking up there. I don't want that. You can still go through it. I think it's very, very good for you to grow as a person. Yeah, and I'll just go ahead and say this. I know John is going to laugh at me, but um, a kind of a theme of this past experience, this weekend for us has been menopause. <laughs> and I'm, I'm speaking to my ladies out there, but you men too, because everyone in this room will be affected by menopause at some time in your life. <laughs> um, I have, you know, for me, this is what I did as a high school kid. I was a public speaker. And when I started this process, I thought, okay, this will, I'll, I'll be able to reclaim some of that, you know, past enjoyment. And it was a horrifying process for me. I'm not going to lie. This was very, very difficult for me. Um, when you go through menopause, and I'm, I'm putting this out here because um, I think it needs to be normalized. Um, my mother never talked to me about this. Um, all women go through this, so, but you were going to get that menopause fog, <laughs> and you are not going to be able to memorize anything, and you're not going to be able to remember anything. And so, for me, this was just a really, really difficult process. I think it ended well, but um, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I... Thank you. I, it, it was... Um, it came from a deep, deep-seated strength that I don't know where I found. Um, so... But I, I just have to say that if you are there or you're almost there, don't lose hope, um, you know, because it is going to happen, and you're going to remember this, I hope, and hopefully you are going to, um, you know, just be, be inspired and hope that you can get through this. Um, maybe it's the English teacher in me, but, like, for me, like, I, and I know this is a little trite, but, you know, it's the journey, right? Not the destination. Um, <laughs> but I leaned into this opportunity like I leaned into many toy-related opportunities because it's the process, the people that I get to connect with, the Sarah Brown Wesling one-on-one time that I get to have as a result of this that made the process worthwhile. And, and one thing that I was thinking in, in, in writing this um, you know, teachers are like YouTuber thing, was what is my thesis, right? Uh, going back to that English teacher idea when it comes to being an educator. And I think all of you have a thesis, a philosophy behind what it means to be a teacher today through your identity, through your experience, through the work that you do with your students. And it doesn't have to be grounded in a personal story like the one, right, that I didn't necessarily have, but a little thought, uh, a little connection that you might make and how can you use your journey as a way to articulate that thesis and how can the TED Talk space be a space in which you um, make that vision come to life. Yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, now I'm going to interject myself here, but like I, the experience of going through it, not knowing if this will turn into anything, uh, the person I did um, develop the talk with ended up creating a presentation about what she learned from doing the process of developing a talk. She never actually gave the talk. She gave a presentation about what that process taught her about herself um, and about what it's like to lead a school. Um, and I think that we have these moments where we learn about ourselves through the practice of going through an app. Like, who would have thought, right? Yeah. Um, I do want to ask Becky Joe a question. Um, so your talk was about hurricanes and heroes. And, or tornadoes. I went with alliteration, I apologize. Um, tornadoes and heroes. I'm so sorry. Tornadoes and heroes. And um, in the moment of being a hero yourself, um, earlier you shared with me a story about cartoon heroes. And I just would... Would you please share with everyone here about a certain hero in your life and why? Yes, okay. So <laughs> it's called Tornadoes and Heroes, and I give my like, hour-long keynote. So whenever I was growing up, I collected Batman memorabilia. 
since a very, very young age. Uh, eight, it was a connection between me and my dad. And I collected memorabilia for years and years and um, took it up to the school because there comes a time in your mid-20s where it's not socially acceptable to have a Batman bedroom anymore. And so I took my collection to the school, and what was once a connection between me and my dad became a connection between me and kids because that connection is what teaching is about. And so, um, and funny, I lost everything, the entire collection I'd collected because it was all at the school. Um, I lost everything, which sounds like an all bummer moment. But that's another, the power of connection, um, because uh, Batman, somebody, one of the parents I had called the local news station and said, this teacher lost her Batman connection, like she's the Batman teacher, and she now has nothing Batman. And so then a blogger, Batman blogger, picked up the story off the news. People started shipping me things from all over the nation, um, really cool people that are actually like drew the cartoons for Batman the Animated Series, like really cool things happen. But probably the most special was the ones that came um, in little kid handwriting that, that said, um, I heard you lost your Batman, here's one of mine. And they'd be like little action figures. And so just that power, you know, it's like little things like that, like the power of, and we talked about heroes. Um, Batman didn't have um, any superpowers. He was just an ordinary person who chose to make a difference in the world around him. And that's exactly what we are as teachers, is we are ordinary people who choose, it's a choice, to make a difference in the world around us. And then I also say that the bat symbol that shines in the sky um, was not to summon Batman. It was to give the people of Gotham hope, hope that somebody was on their side and hope that somebody was fighting for them. And that's what we are as teachers. I shared with you that Batman was my favorite because he was just a dude, right? But now even, now I have eloquent words to follow that up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, just really quickly, um, the talks are normally like the start of learning, right? Because we then investigate further the like, questions and resources and websites that either prompted the talk or um, inspire it. And I was wondering if each of you could quickly share a resource um, that either inspired your talk or that we should check out um, as inspiration afterwards. I'll go first. Um, so if you're interested in trauma, the book I would start, anything by Bruce Perry um, is worth a read. There's a book called The Body Keeps the Score, which is really interesting. But if, even if you know, you know trauma is a thing, okay, you don't have to necessarily dive into that. There's a book called Hope Rising by Dr. Chan Hellman and Casey Gwynn, and because hope is the answer to trauma. That's how you overcome trauma. It boils down to one caring adult in a child's life. And just like you can calculate an A score, you can calculate a hope score. And it's something we can actually build into ch to a child's life. And so if you can present hope. So if you read anything, read Hope Rising by Dr. Chan Hellman and Casey Gwynn. And I'll go next. Um, so I'm a nerd, as you can probably tell from um, my talk. I, the book that I would recommend is by Dr. Kaya Miles. It was called um, All That She Carried, um, or Ashley Sack, um, A Black Family Keepsake. And if you haven't read the book, uh, she goes into great detail about everything that was in the sack and, that, um, and how that related to the, the culture of the era that Ashley lived in. So she talks about pecans, for instance, and how those nourished the people in that area. She talks about weaving, because the sack was a woven cloth. Um, and it was just a fantastic book um, from that perspective. Mine is more technology-based. YouTube. Um, just go on YouTube and type in Oprah and Mrs. Duncan. Therese and Mr. Andrews, Emma Dale, and this is McDonald. Yep. I was going to say YouTube too, so there's this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly think like the people in this room, right? Um, I can name you the number of people from my cohort that I have collaborated with, written op eds, been on webinars, been on mm -hmm. same panels, we've written uh, and wrote. Um, and spoken at similar events, and we would get together on Zoom and figure out how we wanted to. Becky and I did a webinar together on trauma-informed stuff. I asked her to speak on a panel that I was facilitating. And so, like, 
the people in this room, right, are going to be the folks who are going to help you create content. Mm -hmm. And so really use this opportunity to get to know them, what their interest is, what kind of educators they want to be, and think about all the creative ways in which you can bring that message and magic through your collaboration. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that Adele video, yeah. if you've seen it, you'll laugh and cry, right, yeah. at the same time. Beautiful. But also all of you. Um, so does anybody have questions for our panel, either a specific person or to them as a whole? Oh, I know you do. Yes. Do you want the microphone or you just uh, Actually, you can answer this question. <laughs> I'll start, um, and it has nothing to do with knowing talk. Um, I promise. Uh, was actually writing it um, because I wanted to express a concept that was very ethereal, kind of, you know, in my mind, and bring it to people who might not be history teachers or might not t teach Roman technology or know what a mosaic looks like. Or so to write it to where the audience was general you know, it was challenging. And that, to me, is the hardest part. I want to say, like, imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> like, thinking, why me? Do I have anything to say? Um, one way that I overcame that is looking at this as a continual and consistent draft, right? And, and as an English teacher, I wouldn't do first draft final drafts. I would do first draft best draft. Because best always opens up the possibility that you're constantly going to tinker this. Like, even the thing that I gave today, I've given in very different circumstances and would constantly find ways, like a good sauce, to change and add depending on the situation as I grow and change. And so use that lens in whatever story that you come up with, like progress over perfection and knowing that whatever you produce for TED Talk is not going to be the final result. Keeping it simple was hard, like, because there's the complexity of, okay, do I bring in trauma? Do I bring in hope? Do I bring in Batman? Do I bring in, and just winnowing down, like, what is the simplest way to get my message across? Because I think I, I tend to complicate things that don't need to be complicated. And so uh, being simple, that's hard. Mine was emotion, just knowing that if it, if it hadn't been for my teacher, I wouldn't be who I am. And I, I'm going to throw my sense in, too. Um, practically, I do not memorize things. I can't. I struggle. I'm not going to say I can't, because I did. Yep. Um, but the act of actually memorizing something, because you thoughtfully written out the things that you want to mm -hmm. say, the connections you want to make, and then, bleh, right? So um, the practice that I learned that I had to do for me personally was I recorded myself reading it on my iPhone, mm -hmm. and every day on the way to work, I would listen to myself and talk along with myself, and then on the way home, I would talk along yeah. So, yeah, it, and it was kind of, I could only imagine what people driving by thought, but really they probably thought I was using hands-free phone, right? So, um, but that was how I had to get to a point where whenever I gave my recorded video and submitted it, that was able to be confident um, in my memorization. So. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Lee Perez, Nebraska Teacher of the Year, um, 2022. Uh, I've been speaking a lot, so I'm kind of good at it. So I'm really interested in doing this. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my question is, I kind of have an idea of what I want to do my TED Talk on, but my question kind of centers around like human emotion and storytelling, which is kind of big with a lot of my keynotes. I guess my question is like, how much emotion can you bring in? Because I, I know that some of you talked about some very touching subjects. And I've only cried two times in my life, and today was one, and the second time in my life was at the end of Titanic, so. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a joke, but I'm kidding. No, but, but seriously, like how much emotion, because some of you kept your composure very well with some of the emotional topics. So how much emotion can you or should you bring into your speeches? Oh. Um, it's hard. Um, 
I would say when you feel the emotion, let it flow. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that is what connects certain people. I've given this same talk before, for instance, last week, and in the middle of the talk, I just lost it. So don't fight what you feel. Let it flow. It lets people see that you're human and you're vulnerable as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you never know who's sitting in that audience. You never know who's sitting in that audience, especially a child. You could be their hope. So I'll say just let it go. The TED app walks you through so much. So like even what you're going to say and whatever. And I have, so my story, if I sit down and actually share with you what happened that day, I can't speak composure by any means. It's rehearsed. I have a very rehearsed piece. This is the details I will say. These are the details I will not say. These are the things that are going to trigger. So the fact that it is memorized really helps because I practice it. But there are times, like even if I start overthinking, I can go to that place. But And that's a personal thing. But that having just memorized it helps, but if, that, if you feel the emotion, there's a reason. But if you're afraid that you're like, oh no, am I not emotive enough, right? in the audience crying like doesn't like I'm empathetic so I'm like oh don't cry like it's okay yeah. like let me make a joke instead <laughs> And I, I mean, hopefully I can speak for all of you. We practice today. They've prepared this before. But even in the practice, there were moments that emotions bubbled up. And a lot of that was the anticipation of seeing all of you today. So having the fact that um, we could work through those things together um, was really helpful. Okay. I'd also think it's like you don't have to feel this pressure to emote in a certain way. Right, like I am not a crier. Um, I think passion is something that can sh come out regardless of what that emotion is. Um, and, and, and so don't feel like, and I, I also think that some speakers, right, and, and particularly for people of color, if it's related to trauma, um, there's always that question of, do I want to authenticate what I'm saying by that emotional labor that I have to put on for this audience? And so at the end of the day, right, whether or not what degree of emotion you lean into is a deeply subjective and personal question. And I think you will know in that time when and what degree it feels right. Um, I think when I'm speaking about something I'm excited and energetic about, I get passionate. I wouldn't describe it necessarily as emotional. And then and, and when I won teacher of the year, I didn't cry. And there was a teacher who looked at me and said, how are you not crying? And I felt really insecure about that, right? Um, but like, that's just not who I am. And that's not the way that I necessarily emote. I cry, but not necessarily for certain stories. And I think that's okay. We're all different. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else have a question for these amazing teachers? Oh. Yes. I love that everyone over here is like, over there. <laughs> I've just utilized my platform. My platform that I use all year long, and I've just used that. I had that too. Uh, I, I mean, like, I really had to sit and winnow down. And I think I kept avoiding this one, and I did not want to give this because I was afraid. That, and I even didn't want to write about the time that my essay came into the year because I didn't want it to be who I was. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be the point of a teacher. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be teacher of the year because I went through a something that tugged at your heartstrings. So I kept ignoring it. This is, that is a fundamental strength to what I am, and I can't avoid that. And so I had an aunt, um, actually my police traumatic experience too, and um, she was in the Oklahoma City bombing, and so she does motivational speaking, and she's fabulous. And so I went to her and I was like, I don't even want to put this in my essay. Like, I don't want to put, the, I don't even want to talk to other people about it. This is not who I am. And she said, um, your hook. And she said, you'll always have that hook. And it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to say, whatever message you want to give, you have a hook that nobody else has. 
And so I think that sometimes, like, I don't like to be openly vulnerable. I don't want pity. I don't want sympathy. Like, but it's my choice. And so once I owned that, and I said, here's my story, and whatever, it changed. It helped me. So you might be being vulnerable super hard with some fresh people you don't know. <laughs> and so, like, that's not cool. But, um, one lens I applied was how I can, because at the end of the day, right, we are state teachers of the year who are representing the profession. And so what is one way I can contextualize the things that I authentically and personally want to talk to, to like the cultural conversations that's happening about the profession, which is why, you know, as a person who tends to struggle with like personal stories that are emotional and decided to focus on ideas, for me, the lens was, well, what is an idea that should resonate with the profession? And that is this idea of recruitment and retention. That is this idea of teacher burnout. That is this idea of creativity being drained away from the public education sector. And so as you're all thinking about the issues that exist within your own states and as the profession as a whole, think about how you might be able to anchor those all great ideas that you're generating and connect it to those larger cultural conversations. So what they're saying is, from one to 30 ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but no, that was, it's incredibly helpful because it is going to be in a different, it, it's going to be a different experience for everybody. Um, but knowing that, you know, some of them locked in right away and some of them struggled with what exactly they wanted to share. Yes. Actually, sorry to speak for you, Mrs. Russell.
Well, the four of you, thank you. Thank you for sharing, for speaking, it's been amazing.